Hey everyone, Steve here with Phantom History. Thanks so much for checking us out on YouTube. And if you enjoy our content, make sure you subscribe. Enjoy this episode. Thank you for listening to Phantom History. I wanted to remind you that if you become a Patreon supporter at phantomhistory.com, you will gain access to the full interview featuring this episode's guests, as well as other bonus features. Thanks for considering the support and enjoy this episode. Walking to her car late at night after an evening of telling ghost stories, Aubrey Northrop often passes women in large dresses, receives courteous nods from gentlemen in the street, and regularly glimpses an occasional wave from a man sitting on his front porch. Savannah, Georgia is an active city, as most seaport-based cities are, and one of the country's most historic. Aubrey works as a tour guide at the historic Sorrel Weed House in Savannah, Georgia, and it's claimed that it's one of the most haunted, if not the most haunted, mansions in the entire country. While the spirits of the mansion have made themselves known to Aubrey regularly through shadows, orbs, and sounds, it's the glances, greetings, and waves she receives on the way back to her vehicle each night that took the most getting used to. You see, Aubrey says that those greeting her on her way back to her car are no longer among the living. Every single one of them, she says, died more than a century ago, but acknowledge her just the same. It makes sense. After all, Savannah, Georgia is one of the most haunted cities in the entire country. I'm Steve Blanchard. Welcome to Phantom History. With its impressive 16,000 square feet of living space, the Sorrel Weed House overlooking Madison Square in Savannah, Georgia is one of the largest historic mansions in the entire city. Its name reflects two of the most famous families to occupy it during and after the American Civil War. It was built for wealthy shipping merchant Francis Sorrel, who eventually became the father of General Gilbert Moxley Sorrel, one of the youngest generals in the Confederate Army. Eventually, in 1859, the house was purchased by Henry D. Weed, and it remained in the Weed family until 1914. According to Aubrey Northrup, who works at the Sorrel Weed House as a ghost tour guide, the spirits of at least some of the home's former guests are still on the premises, as are others who use the grounds on which it sits as camps and barracks. Many of those spirits, she says, are not afraid to make themselves known. Uh, well, we've got to remember that we've had just a vast history of mass deaths throughout. So you're going to start with the Native Americans that were here. So we've got some of that energy going on. We had uh, when we had Mr. James Oglethorpe come and settle it, he started sparking some different uh, arguments, one of which being the Revolutionary War that came into here and uh, that did take place right out front of the Siege of Savannah. We had the Civil War take place. We've had I believe three different large fires that wiped out big parts of the city. Uh, yellow fever, scarlet fever, all of those big disease epidemics that swiped through and took a lot out. And with so many deaths occurring so rapidly, it wasn't uncommon for each situation where they would have mass graves. So almost every square that you reach at, there's probably a safe assumption that you're walking on someone's dead body, if not thousands of dead bodies. In a city that has seen so much death, it seems logical that the buildings that have witnessed most of that history would retain the energy of those former lives along with the grounds around it. In the Sorrel Weed House, Aubrey says there are several spirits who make themselves known on every level of the massive house, but not all of them are directly tied to the history of the mansion. We vary. We think some of them kind of have the option to come and go as they please. So we're going to probably look at anywhere between 7 and 10 as the average. Obviously with the soldiers, they would not have a house. They would have been on the lower level, so they stick on the lower level. Say the Sorrells, they would have had a full run of the house, and the lower levels were the working areas for the enslaved people they own. So they'd usually stay on the higher up nicer floors. So it all kind of varies from who you're talking to, who you're looking at, which section. As of this interview, Aubrey has worked at the Sorrel Weed House for nearly 10 months and has guided tours during the late afternoons and late evenings. During that time, 
She's had her fair share of encounters with the spirits that occupy the building, she says. And while she has worked as a tour guide at other locations in historic Savannah, even she was surprised at the large number of paranormal encounters she's had in this particular mansion. So I've averaged since I started working here last year, I would guesstimate I've been at about 500 different experiences. Um, usually they're really small and simple. I'm in a women's parlor right now, and the most common thing that I get here is smelling women's perfume. We do think that memory ties can correlate with the different experiences that you're going to have. And I personally make my own perfumes, so I pick up specifically on a lot of floral notes like uh, lavender, lilac has been a big one, and I did have some SA geraniums last week as well. So smelling stuff in this room gets me a lot different feelings. When I first started working here, I'd say for about the first month, uh, especially in the slave quarters across the way in the carriage house, I could not eat any food whatsoever past noon if I had to work because I would start getting severely nauseous to the point where I wasn't sure if I could continue my tours. Hearing footsteps I get on probably a weekly basis, either usually it's on the top floor, when I'm in the basement, I'll hear furniture on this floor moving around. Usually it's the chairs that are out of the desks that will move. That basement, which used to be the main floor before Savannah elevated its streets, now seems to be the home of multiple spirits, all of whom gladly make themselves known to Aubrey and her tour guests. One spirit is simply known as the Shadow Man, and he has one particular area of the basement that he has claimed as his own. Aubrey has encountered him before, as have some of her guests. One tour guest told Aubrey that he felt very large hands on his face while he was exploring one corner of the basement, commonly called the breezeway. Aubrey suggested it was Shadow Man, since the figure often appears larger than life, sometimes as tall as eight feet or more. And it walks in one particular route, repeatedly, in one very specific location. That habitual pace, Aubrey says, has helped offer some clues to Shadow Man's identity. We aren't 100% sure, um, but there are a few different factors about him that make us believe that he can be a soldier from the Siege of Savannah Revolutionary War battle. Uh, first off, even though he shows off as an eight foot tall person, uh, there have been quite a few guests, usually these are mediums that will take the tours that say they specialize that in the focusing that they believe not only was he a soldier, but supposedly he was a very short soldier. And so in the actual life, he showed up as very tall and big because he wasn't seen that way in life, which would make a lot of sense. Um, and even without a bringing a medium into it, he has a tendency to pace up and down the breezeway, which would have been around where the barracks were. So if it was pacing as if he was standing guard, maybe, and people have heard heavy footsteps. That's something that I personally heard as well. And the footsteps I've heard also at Martian House with the Civil War soldiers. So I'm already kind of familiar with soldier footsteps in the first place. Interestingly, despite her job as a tour guide at one of the most haunted locations in the city of Savannah, Aubrey has a fear of the dark. Each night, she leads groups throughout the mansion, sharing historical facts and paranormal anecdotes along the way. But when those tour guests finally leave, Aubrey usually finds herself alone, well, at least the only living person alone, in the home, turning off lights and locking doors for the night. Not too long ago, Aubrey said that she was startled, and then comforted, by an unusual event in the home while she was there alone. About a month or two ago, I was closing up the house and I was in the main house by myself. And when we go back there, we have to turn all the lights off. And I started getting all the basic lanterns and everything downstairs turned off. And I was coming around the corner of the staircase and I just hear this massive slam. And I knew which door made the noise. I didn't tell exactly which one it was. It slammed so loudly that the panes, uh, the glass in the window panes were shaking and you could hear that shatter with it. But the thing is, that door was locked and so it would have to be someone that had to really hit it hard but outside of that door is a locked gate and outside of that gate is another gate so there's no way that anyone could have possibly gotten to that door to make that noise 
And this was also around 12.30 at night. So it was quiet enough that I could tell exactly if there were any people where they were at. When I'm closing up the house in the middle of the night, turning off all the lights in the dark, I don't do well with that. And I frequently will ask the spirits to make some type of noise, whether it's knocking on a door, uh, grabbing my hand, pulling on my skirt, whispering in my ear, anything that they can do to make me not feel alone. And they're usually pretty good at that. And I'm not sure maybe that's what they were trying to do, but kind of took it overboard a step. <laughs> but it was nice. Um, I did say, hey, next time, if you want to let me know you're there, tone it down a bit, because that was a tad bit much, and that freaked me out a bit. <laughs> so maybe a smaller little knock would be fine. But it's not just noises that have proven to Aubrey that the Sorrel Weed Mansion is haunted. With her own eyes, she has seen signs of the paranormal during her time at the house, and so have multiple guests. I've seen everything from mists, orbs, shadow figures, full body apparitions. About a month ago, the couch that I'm sitting on right now, there were about two hands that looked like kid-sized hands, it was the size of mine, underneath this section that just kind of scurried back really quick, as if there was a kid trying to hide. Um, so we've got a couple of guests I've got brought into the attention of some of my guests. We think we may know who that is, but, you know, we've got a lot going on here. And most of what is going on at the Sorrel Weed House is linked to one of the mansion's namesakes and the tragedy that befell his wife and one of his enslaved women. That story, which some debate as legend and others say as fact, can be at least partially backed up by journal entries and newspaper clippings from the time, according to Aubrey. There was the original owner, Francis Sorrell, his second wife, Matilda, who was the lady of the home for this specific property. Rumor has it, and for a lot of different articles and reports that we've personally gotten, there was a inappropriate sexual involvement between Francis and their head enslaved person. Eventually, some point came around where Matilda had walked in on Francis with this enslaved person committing this heinous act and that would be very disturbing. She left and she eventually made her way up to the top balcony, which would have been the third floor. She did reportedly jump off and land on the bottom deck floor. Uh, she did not die instantly though. She brought inside and did eventually perish in the home. And then after only two weeks, the enslaved person that was involved was found hanging, which is more believed to be a murder. That enslaved woman, named Molly, was likely a victim of the times and was forced into the inappropriate relationship by the master of the house. The alleged murder, if that is in fact what happened to Molly, has never been solved. But newspapers did document the death of Matilda, who, as Aubrey said, somehow fell from the third floor balcony, sustained severe injuries, and then died a short time later within the house. The spirits of all three people in this tragic tale, Aubrey says, still roam the home and have been seen by those within its walls and even captured on cameras by those walking past the square out front. All three of them are believed to be here. Francis went on to die in the neighboring house right next door. However, it is believed that he does come back here quite a bit. This was his original home, so it would be safe to assume that he would watch over everything. Uh, Matilda is usually seen in the windows from the front of the house. If you take a picture, it's not uncommon to get her. I've done that. I've had a handful of walking tours that have come through and said they've gotten her. Usually all on the top floor, which would have been where the master bedroom was, and she's usually looking out. But then we had a lady about two weeks ago say that she saw her standing in the gentleman's parlor. She's been captured a few times in different pictures by the guests that have taken our tours. And then Molly, the safe girl in the carriage house, is also frequently seen, usually in her bedroom. The Sorrel Weed House has slowly returned to its original state after being home to multiple owners over the years. Money raised from the tours Aubrey and her colleagues give at the house have helped in that restoration. However, the furnishings and decor that now adorn the historic home are not original and all have been brought in from other locations and is a representation of how the home looked during the time of the Sorrells. Often, spirits can connect themselves to items. 
but Aubrey isn't sure if any of the furniture has specific energy tied to it. But she does know that one room in particular, down in the basement, has quite a powerful impact on guests of the tours, especially those with medical conditions. Uh, the only thing that we know brought some energy with it, not so much spirit, but some just residual energy would be uh, downstairs in the surgical room, we have an old medical kit and we have musket bullets. So the musket bullets were taken from the property during an excavation process we did in the courtyard. So those are from this property, from the Siege of Savannah, and very well could have possibly killed people. So it wouldn't surprise me if that had something to do with some of the energy we get. And then the medical kit, uh, there are dental pliers on the top shelf. And about three years ago, three or four years, people started reporting aches and pains in their mouths specifically and tasting blood. So we're wondering if maybe those dental pulls had some energy with them too to cause those pains. Those dental pliers and the recovered musket balls from the courtyard all likely saw some agonizing history on the land surrounding the home or somewhere nearby. But why, exactly, would a home built in 1840 have a surgical room hidden within its lower levels? The answer, according to Aubrey, isn't as surprising as you might think. So that would have been an operating room for a gentleman named Frank Sorrell. He was Francis's first wife. Uh, they had the youngest child that would not be Frank. Frank was a very skilled trauma surgeon, and he was one of the few people back then to go to multiple medical schools, get multiple degrees, and he was very, very skilled, which was good. However, that also meant that his survival rate was roughly around 50%. He did operate down there in that specific room for quite a few years until the Civil War hit. He was then enlisted and moved out to go assist with the medical service on that side. Safety wasn't as big as it is now, so uh, carriage accidents, especially on squares, happen quite frequently here in Savannah and could potentially be fatal. A horse gets spooked, takes that turn too hard, flips over. That could cause a lot of injuries. With Savannah being a big shipping port, uh, everyone that would need medical attention from the different shipping merchants coming by through uh, the different ironwork foundries, you would have a lot of injuries there. So honestly, him working here alone, it would be a great way for practice because just generalized accidents happen frequently and they were much more severe and not as easily treated back then. But for a while, he, we did have him operating back there and with a, roughly around, say he operated on 10 people a day, five people would unfortunately die. We think that did cause quite a bit of residual energy to be left behind as well. It wasn't just the injured who perished in the home, nor was it only soldiers from a number of bloody wars. Children also passed away, mostly due to childhood illnesses that could not be treated properly at the time. Aubrey says several of those children remain in the Sorrel Weed home, and, just like their living counterparts, they are friendly and mischievous, depending on which ones decide to interact. So there are quite a few different children. We do think we may have Matilda had lost three of her children. We think we may have one or two of those children, one of them being Matilda Ann, who was her six-year-old daughter. And then she did have two boys that she lost as well. For Matilda Ann, we do have a documented that scarlet fever at the years of six years old. The two boys were definitely on the younger side, and so that could have just been a basic illness or just difficulty thriving as a child. And we think we may have at least one of those boys sticking around. I do believe that the girl that I saw on the main floor here that was underneath this couch is most likely Matilda Ann because this would be more of the area she would be appearing in when she's alive. The lower level would be, we'd have Sarah and the earring thief is what we call them due to his bad habits of stealing earrings. But Sarah's my favorite and I'd say she's definitely by far the one that I've interacted with the most from seeing her a few times in different forms. Uh, she's personally held my hand. She helped, has definitely helped me with going through the dark and making me feel a little bit more comfortable with that. And she does at least know what I'm about to talk to her on my tours too, because there will be times where I get ready to mention her and someone will play hide and seek on accident and find her and they freak out because they said that it felt like a kid grabbed their ankle or tugged on their pants. Aubrey says that she, like most tour guides, 
doesn't know all of the answers. Sarah, the favorite spirit she mentioned, is likely not linked directly to the Sorrel Weed House. Investigators and guides aren't even sure why that spirit is there, but through multiple spirit box sessions, they have been able to find out her name, at least. The earring thief, who is usually spotted in the basement, is likely one of Matilda's boys who died at a young age, but that spirit has yet to reveal its true identity. Fortunately for Aubrey, and for the guests at the house, the spirits there seem friendly, or at least accommodating to those interested in learning the history of the house and taking a glimpse back into time of what used to be a social hub of Savannah, Georgia. Aubrey often leaves work late, and, like most of us, she rarely leaves her work behind as she heads home. In fact, her interactions with the spirits of Savannah rarely end when she turns the lock on the door of the Sorrel Weed House. When I leave work, it's usually late at night, if, especially on our slower season where it's less touristy out, and it can sometimes just be me and maybe one other person a square. And I will notice that even though I know that it's only me and one other living person on the square, I can walk around and I'll see uh, shadow figures, ladies in full evening gowns, different people just walking by me casually. Quite often, even the Green Belgium house, there's sometimes a person that likes to sit outside on the porch and they'll wave to me as I walk by going to my car. You can hear the soldiers walking around on occasions as well. Again, I'm familiar with that boot step sound, so I can pretty pinpoint them out pretty easily. There's just a lot of people everywhere. I like to say that in both a nice and a creepy way, you're never alone. Thank you to Aubrey Northrup with the Sorrel Weed House of Savannah, Georgia for sharing her knowledge and experience for this episode of Phantom History. For more information on the historic building or to book your own tour, visit sorrelweedhouse.com. If you would like to hear even more about Aubrey's paranormal encounters at the Sorrel Weed House, consider supporting the podcast through Patreon, where you will gain access to full interviews with guests and other bonus materials that dive deeper into the history and hauntings of historic locations around the country. Music for this episode was provided by Chad Couch, Silverman Sound, and Purple Planet Music. You can follow Phantom History on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter, and contact me directly with ideas for future episodes at podcast at phantomhistory.com. As always, thanks for listening. Hey, Steve here. Thanks so much for checking out that content. And before you go, I wanted to let you know that if you become a supporter of the podcast through Patreon, you'll gain access to bonus content. And if you subscribe to our newsletter at phantomhistory.com, we will let you know when that bonus content becomes available and when a new episode drops. And one more thing, I'm always looking for ideas for future episodes. So if you have an experience or a location you think that I should focus on, please let me know through the website or you can email me directly at podcast at phantomhistory.com.